It's election season, and on Friday, April 23rd, 2021, was the first day of in-person absentee voting at your local registrar's office for both the Democratic and Republican primaries for the office of governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, and the Virginia House of Delegates. The question is, whom do you want to you to serve for you in the House and in state government? This is Say the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. You're listening to Stay of the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville. So glad that you've tuned in to join us on this beautiful Sunday morning. You know, it is springtime and we're having phenomenal weather. And we hope that you are still staying healthy, staying safe, because remember, we will get through this time together. Here on WNSB, here you can follow us on our social media at Hot. 91 online that's hot 91 online we want we, we want to talk about a few things here and we got phenomenal guests who are going to join us remember for the month of april may and june we're having every candidate in the democratic slate that's running for office in the state area here in hampton roads and also for lieutenant governor governor and also attorney general to have a conversation with you to talk about issues that are important to you. But we also want you, we want to talk about the trending topics. And we know we got the, we just came out of this last week, an opportunity where we can breathe again. And that is the verdict that came down on now former officer and now convicted felon, Derek Chauvin, for the murder of George Floyd. There were many emotions flying around. We've got tons of comments and, and analysis from persons locally and around the state, around the United States, and around the world. Well, we want to know what you think. So go to our social media at Hot91 Online in our link tree and comment on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and let us know what you think. Also, YouTube, let us know what you think about the Derek Chauvin case. Let us know what you think about the verdict. Let us know what you think about State of the Water and our guests today. So as I mentioned earlier, that here on State of the Water for the month of April, May, and June, we're having individuals who are serving us and wanting to run for state office in the state house and also for state office of governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general join us because we believe here on State of Water that we want to bring the policymakers to you, the community. So our very first guest is someone that we wanted to have for so long on the show. He's a huge supporter of his alma mater, and this is Delegate Lamont Bagby. Delegate, welcome to State of the Water. Thanks, Doc, uh, for having me. Looking forward to Behold the Green and Gold. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you know, you know, I, I just want to say to our guests that, again, this is, a, this is a gentleman who we've been looking to have on the show for a while and someone who holds a lot of, a lot of important positions here in state government and really to help guiding, guide public policy impacting the African-American community. So, but I wanted to put out first that you are a Norfolk State alum first, a proud Norfolk State alum. <laughs> yes, proud, uh, proud Norfolk State alum, and I also had the pleasure of serving on the Board of Visitors uh, at Norfolk State. Absolutely. And not only that, but you also are a House delegate representing the 74th District, and also you are currently chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Tell us Tell us about your, right now, well, before we get into the legislative part, um, I talked about our trending topic uh, this week, of course, the verdict, the guilty verdict on all charges, which I think surprised a lot of people, definitely surprised me, uh, for the murder of George Floyd by now former officer and convicted felon Derek Chauvin. Give us your thoughts when you heard that verdict. Well, in conversations leading up to it, I, I think everybody had their sort of guesses of which way it was going to go, and um, no one had complete confidence that it would that the jury 
would return the proper verdict. Um, and so, you know, my my first response was family. Yes. Uh, and, and and it's not familyized, but family. We started we start moving toward uh, feeling like once we have this big uproar and all things moving towards justice, uh, we we have an end, uh, at least in the judicial system, uh, that's beyond just paying the family uh, a settlement. Uh, because while that's good for them and, 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 and prayerful that it helps them with their healing, uh, it does not discourage the next police officer or the next uh, community uh, uh, volunteer that, that's policing the neighborhood to not kill us. I mean, I don't That's know right. any other way to put it, but what helped discourage that 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 action? Uh, and, and and we well know that we can't always control what's in the hearts of men right. uh, and women uh, that are in uniform, but we can make sure that they have a consequence for their action. Absolutely. And so finally, we were able to see on a national, global level um, that this individual will pay for uh, his actions. Absolutely. You know, it's it's funny you mentioned uh, everyone was um, looking at the verdict, wondering if we would get the right verdict. And one thing that we were, you know, different shows we were on, one thing that I would always say was, you know, again, it's, it, to me it was clear, to the jury it was clear, to the rest of the world it was clear, but Rodney King, but Trayvon Martin, but Blank, but this, but this. There were so many cases where the lack of accountability for bad actors uh, were left unchecked. And uh, I, I think that this was something that we can now build up on, as opposed to, like you said, uh, it's not finalized, but it's definitely a moment that we can look and not celebrate, but we can validate you know, these issues and move forward with positive public policy. Yeah, and, and we still have work to do. I mean, I guess that's a segue into the legislature um, because I have colleagues that have been working on this tirelessly since they got into the legislature, like Don Scott. He, he's a new, new oh, yeah. member of, our, of the General Assembly. Here in Hampton uh, Rose, Jeff, that's right. Jeff, Jeff Bourne has been working on it aggressively. Uh, uh, Jennifer McClellan has been working on it. Uh, it uh, Louise Lucas, so many individuals have been working on uh, not only justice reform, but also how we uh, hold our police uh, departments accountable for their actions. And one of the things that we weren't able to get done and get across, the Black Caucus wasn't able to get across the finish line was qualified immunity. And mm. that is the uh, one piece of legislation uh, to push across the next session. It would be qualified immunity because that will be the piece that will illustrate Folks are really ready uh, to make sure that there's no excuses moving forward and there are no resources available to those individuals uh, that are paid for by uh, public dollars to defend these individuals. Absolutely. Well, you know, tell us, tell our audience a little bit about um, what the responsibilities of the chair of Virginia Legislative Black Caucus is. Yes, and, and so... As chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, it's been very rewarding because I've been able to uh, have a seat at the table on everything from marijuana justice reform to how we fund our uh, uh, K-12 public education, public school. Uh-huh. Uh, but particularly one of the things that's been important to me is working with our uh, new chair of appropriations, Luke Torian, Absolutely. On, uh, <laughs> on making sure that our HBCU get their fair share. Absolutely. Uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed walk, working with Dr. J and, and Dr. Abdullah down in uh, Virginia State University um, and just making sure that we, 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 we pay some catch up as it relates to uh, the resources that our universities have been able to uh, receive um, because, you know, I, the, the individual that came before us uh-huh. uh, laid the groundwork, but that groundwork has not been supported. That's right. Uh, like our <laughs> PWIs have been supported in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, and so we've been working really diligently for that. Uh, and outside of that, we, we have been working to make sure that uh, we, we we move the ball forward 
as it relates to housing uh, and particularly evictions. And then even with, with what we're in right now as it relates to the pandemic, making sure that not only individuals had access to testing before we had the vaccination, but now making sure that individuals uh, that look like us uh, have an opportunity to receive the vaccination and then go for deeper into, into health care. And so there are a number of champions of those respective issues uh, in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. And I've just been so honored to be able to amplify those voices and center them in those issues uh, and have the entire caucus uh, together, uh, not fighting uh, fighting for whose who's name is going to be on the piece of legislation, uh -huh. but really getting behind one another and allowing each other to lead and centering the issues. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, Don Scott, you mentioned Senator Louise Lucas, uh, you mentioned uh, Delegate Luke Torian. I, I really don't think our, 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 our state really understands and really what's happening here in the Commonwealth, the influence and, and the positions that are held by African-American legislators really for the first time in the history of the Commonwealth and the important work that you're doing, but not just important, but just how impactful it's been for African-American communities and the Commonwealth in general. You know, uh, Delegate, you mentioned the funding, you know, for HBCUs, our state HBCUs. First of all, I think we got two of the best leaders of our state HBCUs. Uh, no that, question. You know, <laughs> hands down, you know, and the work, no the work that they're doing on the campuses and promoting the universities is just phenomenal. And we see that with enrollment. We see that with the improvements on uh, physical campuses and so forth. But the funding. Talk about the funding that was given, uh, that was finally allocated to Virginia State and Norfolk State University. Yeah, so so there are, there are a number of things that, um, you know, Dr. J and Dr. Abdullah uh, were able to come to us and say, hey, here are some ways that you all can support us that we haven't had the support in the past. Uh, of course, uh, well, of course, one of those things would be buildings uh, because, the state primarily is the um, vehicle for all universities throughout the Commonwealth uh -huh. uh, to build new new buildings, and so we were able to fund um, some large uh, capital improvements at Norfolk State and large capital improvements uh, at Virginia State. But then also, uh, one of the things we were able to do at Norfolk State was to be able to fund um, this. Uh, Healthcare nursing program that they're collaborating with uh, ODU uh, and others, uh, and then we were able to uh, also uh, support Norfolk State in their effort. And this was even before the pandemic, and we realized how critical it was. We were able to support funding for uh, Norfolk State technology infrastructure uh, and, and, and make sure that they were able to move into the. 21st century, uh, finally, uh, with their infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, we were, we are, and this is one of the things that uh, Delegate T uh, Chairman Torian has been working on aggressively, right. is making sure we, we, we put universities in a position where they don't have to raise tuition on our, um, on, on our, uh, <laughs> students. our students. That's right. That's right. We give them the resources to do whatever it is they need so that they don't have to lean on families that are uh, struggling to put their their young people or, uh, uh, or adults through um, through higher education. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the the other part of this work that's being done is that there's there are bills that are passed that, again, creates equity and equality. There's a lot of lip services given. But there, it actually takes public policy to make that happen. Talk about a few of the bills that, that you've uh, patron and, and champion or co-patron that you think really speaks to that in this last um, legislative cycle. Yeah, so there, there are a couple. One of, one of the pieces of legislation that I spent a lot of time working on um, was uh, the marijuana justice reform and making sure that um, it included justice reform. Uh, and another 
separate piece of legislation uh, that we dealt with was expungement. Yes. Uh, and, and we we see time and time again, and I get calls time and time again related to justice. And sometimes that's associated with individuals that are serving time right now. Right. But sometimes that's individuals that have served their time and have come out and just can't get one foot in front of the other um, because they've been held back because of uh, their record. And so um, even I, I, if I can give a quick example of, it, uh, of individuals that come out and they, they went in because they had substance usage uh, challenges uh-huh. and with addiction. And so they come out, they figure out a way, and they want to go in and, and then help peer recovery uh, for individuals that are experiencing the same challenges, but they can't because there's a there's a barrier that crime right. uh, prevents them from being able to do that. But no better person to help somebody come out of uh, of a hole uh, than the person that ha- actually has come out of that same hole. That's right. Uh, and, and and so we want to make sure that they are empowered and able to do that. Uh, and then also, as we work continue to work on the marijuana legislation, we want to make sure that those individuals in those communities, and particularly those individuals that look like us, that have been disenfranchised and and incarcerated behind this, are able to benefit from uh, the same thing that they were incarcerated for and fined for, and and, and we just want to make sure that that is fair. You know, one of the things that I've really been proud of uh, 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 that we were able to do was to really crack down on predatory lenders. And those lenders were charging folks in our communities uh, anywhere from 300 to 500 percent on a loan. And so we were able to crack down on them uh, last year, and and that's something I'm really proud of. I'm seeing a lot of these predatory lenders close down, and that is good for our community. Did you just say 300 to 500 percent interest? Yes. Wow. Yes. I mean, we have individuals that would borrow five hundred dollars that over the life of the loan had to pay uh any somewhere around ten thousand dollars off of that one loan they get you in it and then they just keep you down you know back in the day they call that loan sharking which i which i think is against against the yeah. law but you know, i i gotta get I, I can't put loan sharks in that thing because I, I don't think the loan sharks could, could, could get you to pay that much interest. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know, all these things are are good and but there was one piece of legislation that I really want you to kind of delve into as it relates to what the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus did uh and that's with voting rights, especially here in Hampton Roads and across the Commonwealth. What was talk about the significance of the voting rights legislation that that was passed and the impact that you believe it will have in the future? Yes, and I, got, I have to credit um, uh, Marcia, Delegate Marcia Price from Newport News and Jennifer McClellan here in Richmond uh, for their work. I mean, they worked really aggressively on this legislation. Uh, it's legislation that even individuals before us have been, ha, ha, uh, have been working on. Uh, and we, we found it to come to the surface and really see a need for it as we were moving uh, through the um, uh, redistricting reform uh, that some would consider gerrymandering uh, legislation, but it did the legislation that, that we put before a constitutional amendment didn't really address um, our concerns. Uh-huh. And so what we wanted to do is to, is to work to protect access to the ballot box. Um, and we also had in conjunction with that piece of legislation, legislation uh, that make, makes it easier uh, and more accessible, to, uh, the, the ballot box more easier and accessible, uh-huh. uh, including uh, the drop boxes that we used in the last uh, election, including early voting, including um, um, mail in voting. Uh, particularly, I mean, to be frank, all the things that you hear uh, – Donald Trump and his followers opposed. Yeah. <laughs> and so I am so pleased that as you see uh, states across the nation go in the wrong direction 
Virginia is one of the only states that are moving aggressively in the right direction. Absolutely. Uh, as it relates to voting rights and protecting voter rights, uh, even ahead of uh, what we hope to see on the national level uh, as they address voting rights. Uh, I'm happy that we have these two black women that have led the charge uh, in addressing uh, voting rights and voting protection. And never in the Commonwealth of Virginia has voting been as easy and more accessible as it is now. Uh, and as, as we look at it, it's April and early voting has already started. You're listening to WNSB Blazing Hot 91. This is Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Claville. For the month of April, May, and June, we're bringing candidates who are going to run for office to represent you in the state legislature and also for governor, attorney general, and lieutenant governor. Follow us on social media at Hot 91 Online. Share, comment, and let us know your thoughts also about the trending topic of the guilty verdict against former officer, and now convicted felon, Derek Chauvin, for the murder of George Floyd. Right now, we're talking to Delegate Lamont Bagby, who is a proud Norfolk State alum, representing the 74th District, and currently the chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Delegate Bagby, you talked about you know, the voting rights bills, you know, and we, we've talked about that a couple of shows. We had Alex Delegate ask you on last week, and we actually had Tasha Holloway, who was actually the catalyst that filed a private citizen that filed the lawsuit against the city of Virginia Beach for their type of system in creating districts, uh, what we call at-large system, to dilute the vote of African Americans. And one thing that we kind of discussed and, and came to the, what I believe, the conclusion of is that the Commonwealth of Virginia is moving in such a way that it really could be the legislation that, that, that is being championed by the Democratic Party and Virginia Legislative Black Caucus and workers in the community really could be an example to the rest of the country on how to do progressive politics as opposed to regressive politics. Yes, and, and even, I mean, the goal is always to dilute our vote. Um, um, and, and so this legislation is going to combat that. Even when you look at um, individuals who are incarcerated being counted uh, in respective districts uh, and, and packing them all into one district, um, knowing that they can't actually vote uh, right. <laughs> while incarcerated. And that's something. <laughs> And, and, and so uh, we have districts, particularly in the rural area, uh, that the, that's a significant population of the individuals in, the, in respective districts, uh-huh. and they can't vote. And so it, make, it makes it appear that um, minorities, and particularly blacks, have an opportunity to choose their candidate of choice, but it's a false uh, narrative and it's a, it's a, false, it's a false positive because those individuals can't actually vote. And so we have been able to move the needle uh, as it relates to uh, fair uh, fair voting uh, without this piece of legislation. But this piece of legislation really codifies and moves us in, a, in, a, in, the, in the direction that we need to go uh, and so that our children won't have to fight this same battle and figure out how to um, uh to, 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 to get a fair process, um, we, we have moved that needle aggressively with this piece of legislation, and, and uh, it does so much uh, to make sure that we are no longer uh, disenfranchised when it comes to uh, how we are counted and, uh, and our access to the ballot box. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're, we've got a few more minutes left, and I want to talk about the future legislation and your push for coming back into the legislature um, if, if you're reelected. And, and I think everybody in Norfolk State is rooting for that. I know your supporters in your district and so forth. But what what is your what are your views and what's your push for the next uh, year, next four years? Well, we still have a significant amount of work to do related to um justice reform. There are a number of pieces that we need to finish. We need to really address barrier crime and removing some of these barrier crimes from um, 
uh, code, we also need to make sure we finally get qualified immunity. Uh-huh. Um, and, 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 and for the most part, a lot of things is relied upon money. Um, uh, we have to continue to follow the money. And while we were able to do a number of things for our uh, Norfolk State and Virginia State, there is so much more that we can do to help our universities. And that is something that needs to be protected year after year. Uh, and now I also believe that there's, there's even though Hampton and Virginia Union are private institutions, there's more that we can do for them. And then I do not want to forget our black students at the PWI. Uh, we, have, I, we have seen the PWI, some of them open their eyes and, and start to make the right decision. We just saw William and Mary move uh, towards renaming some of the buildings. Um, that took a lot of work and pressure. We see George Mason and ODU move forward with a with black president. Uh, that is something for us to be proud of. So we still have work to do at these other universities uh, that uh, VMI uh, went with the uh, with the black black leader. Um, and we need to just make sure that we uh, give those individuals the support that they need to take care of not only their university as a whole, but make sure that those individuals, uh, those black individuals on those campuses, uh, are uh, continue to, well begin to get the resources that they need uh, to thrive. Uh, and so we want to make sure our HBCUs are protected, but we want to make sure that black students uh, across the Commonwealth uh, receive the resources that they need to to, to be productive. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are and, some, and the, and, go, go ahead, go, go ahead, delegate, go ahead. The, 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 the thing about the black caucus also that I want folks to make sure that they remember is the work that we do rather is focus on uh, combating food deserts yes. or rather it is making sure folks uh, have the resources they need for eviction or making sure that, uh, um, that, the reasons are, are, are there uh, for attorneys. Uh, that work doesn't just benefit uh, black folks and folks that look like you and I. That work benefits all those individuals, even, even the whites in Southwest, uh, that are disenfranchised. Uh, because a lot of our fights aren't fights uh, based solely on uh, the color of individual skin, but it's, That's right. it's, it's the individuals that are disenfranchised, and oftentimes those individuals are dis- that are disenfranchised are those that are, that are, that are living uh, at or below the poverty line. Absolutely, absolutely, delegate. Look, I, I, we could talk for an entire hour, even more, because there's so much. Uh, that you've done while like you've been in the state legislature, so much you've done as chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. And we're fortunate to have individuals like yourself, Cliff Hayes, Candy King, Senator Lucas, Senator Spruill, and many, many others who have come through Norfolk State serving the people of the Commonwealth, serving your district, serving the community. And we're so glad to have you. Give us your website very quickly or where they can get more information about your campaign. All right, Don, thank you for having me, and thanks for having my colleagues on and, and uplifting our voices and centering our work. Uh, uh, my website is www.lamontbagby.org, and I appreciate your support. And, again, behold the green and gold. I'm so proud <laughs> of so many individuals that are coming out of North State and doing great things. Absolutely. And thank you so much for your support for the Center for African American Public Policy. We'll see you soon. We'll talk soon. All right, man. Thank you. God bless you. God bless. Appreciate you. Well, again, here for the month of April, May, and June, we're having uh, individuals from the Hampton Roads area and also state offices who are running for office to bring policymakers, movers, and shakers to you. And we'll be back in just a moment with our next guest. Make sure you wake up early Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. with the Blazing Hot Morning Show. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. I'll have your behold moment, your good news, your headline news, and don't forget, entertainment news. I'm DJ INC from the Top Ropes. I'll tell you why every day is a holiday. I'll give you the update on those sports and on-the-spot traffic and weather updates. And check out the Blazing Hot Tea Report with your girl, K-Noteworthy, where I'll be serving all the scoop about your favorite celebrities. And can't forget about the Blazing Hot Morning Shower mixed with the legendary DJ Heart Attack. So start your day with us Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. right here on Blazing Hot 91. We'll get through this together. 
Blazing Hot 91 is looking for your support. Financial support, that is. Get ready. Coming this May, we're going to see how much you love us. Quiet, he's going to say something. We'll be asking for your tax-deductible contribution. We're a public radio station. That means we're supported by you, the listener. You guys tell us you love us all the time. The hottest radio station. Now, you can show us how much. And that keeps us blazing the airways with your urban alternative mix of music. Yo, you know the deal. So start planning your contribution to Blazing Hot 91 now. Be ready to drop that cash. Save the date. May 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's all love, and it's all for you on Blazing Hot, Hot 9191. For the month of April, May, and June, here on Stay of the Water, we're bringing candidates who want to run for statewide office for either election or re-election to engage you, the community. Also, we want you to follow us on our social media at Hot 91 Online. That's at Hot 91 Online. In our link tree, on our website, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We want you to comment, like, and share, and engage us to let us know what's on your mind. Because here on Stay of the Water, the question is not what you, what we tell you, but what you want. We want you to let us know. The policymakers, let them know exactly what's affecting you in your community. Also, on our trending topic, we want you to talk about the recent guilty verdict of now former officer and convicted felon Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. Is it just to serve or is it just enough? So, again, we're so glad to have you here on Save the Water. It's so glad to have you join us on this beautiful Sunday. Hopefully you're still staying safe and you're monitoring your health because we will get through this together. Things are opening up in our community. We're so glad for the vaccines that are rolling in, so glad for individuals who are coming back to work. Schools are opening up. But we still want you to be safe. We still got to get through this. But, again, take care of your health and take care of your family and make sure you consult with your health officials. In the first half hour, we had NSU alum, Delegate Lamont Bagme, who is also delegate for District 74 and chair of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus to talk about a lot of important legislation impacting you, the community, and the Commonwealth and African Americans that was passed in the last legislative session. This hour, we have an individual who wants to run to represent the 31st district here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I've got a personal connection to this individual as well, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Rod Hall, welcome to Stay in the Water. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah, you're good to go. (laughs) Oh, fantastic, fantastic. uh, I am just absolutely delighted to be with you and your your listening audience this afternoon, brother. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Now, Rod, I had to give the disclaimer of our personal connection that we have. Uh, I'll let you talk about it if you want to. <laughs> you know, look, as it, as it is your show, good doctor, I, 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 will, I will yield to you. Look, and I'll, I'll cover up. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, cover any any inconsistencies or inaccuracies that that might arise from it. But I'll, I'll defer to you. There you go. So, so look, you know, we're both here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, you're in Northern uh, Virginia. I'm here in Hampton Roads. But yep. we're but we're both Louisiana boys, and that is uh, correct. <laughs> we were born and raised in a city called Shreveport, Louisiana, and we both attended the same high school, Cattle Parish Magnet High School. Uh, myself, class of '93. You, class of '90. Four. Four. Absolutely. Correct. And we that both. Correct. I, I looked up to you. <laughs> yes, that is correct. You know, and we both went to college uh, in Louisiana, myself at Southern University and also at Southern University Law Center in LSU and you at Dillard University in New Orleans. That's correct. That is correct. That is correct. It is. Uh, I guess you, you could say we're, we are two. We're two Bayou boys that, that made good. And now uh, having established ourselves here in that. The great Commonwealth of, of Virginia looking to uh, continue to press the needle forward on behalf of our, our respective communities. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, here for the month of April, May and June, we're bringing in policymakers, movers and shakers and candidates who want to run to represent uh, individuals either statewide as governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general or represent districts in the House of Delegates. And for you, you want to represent District 31. But before we, get, right. before we get there, you know, our trending topic here on our, that we're asking our listeners to comment, like, and share, and give their thoughts on social media at Hot 81 Online 
is the verdict that came down just last week for mm-hmm. the murder of George Floyd by that were guilty on all charges against now the former officer and convicted felon Derek Chauvin. You know, yeah. Rod. I, I, you know, like I said, we you know we both grew up in what we call the real South, right? The dirty Correct. South, and Correct. and and we saw a lot of these actions that are happening um, a lot. I mean, I, I mean, I still remember. Um, I still remember to see the Grow riots, you know, and mm-hmm. the incident at mm-hmm. Hot Biscuit, uh, where an African American male, in thinking eighty eighty eight, I believe, was I believe, yeah. sh- shot and killed by the police unarmed. Um, you know, and I, I remember that as a kid and how it how, pe- you know, our, our our white colleagues, parents were checking the kids, their, their kids out of school. And we were mm-hmm. like, what's going on? You know, we, I, we didn't know anything until I got back home and I saw Dan Rather on CBS. And, and I thought about that, I, you know, when I saw the, the murder of George Floyd and, and the things that transpired afterwards. What went through your mind uh, when the verdict was read and what what are your feelings moving forward? Well, Eric, thank you. Thank you again for, for having me. Delighted to be with you and your, your listening audience um, this after this afternoon. Um, I think to just put it bluntly, a sense of relief uh, with respect to the verdict that came down. Um, but I, I think it, it says something that in the back of my mind that you know, there was potentially a possibility that it could have gone yeah. another way, yeah. right? Given given some of the the previous verdicts with respect to you know interactions with 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 law enforcement, and I think I think it it says something that we were able to see essentially the the loss of life right before our own eyes. Um, and yet to, to still have yeah. doubt about whether or not justice would, would be ultimately served, I think it still speaks to the amount of work we have to do here, not only within the, the state of Virginia, but, but, but all across the country. As, the, as an African-American man, as the father of three young kids, two of, two of whom are, uh, are young African-American boys, you know, I've had to have some serious tough conversations with with my my sons over the course of this past year because my oldest is 11 wow you know he understands his father you know the the nature of this business is to stay abreast of of current events and it is not uncommon for him to sit down with me and watch the evening news or msnbc or cnn what have you Uh and um we've and i'm sure like you i know you have you have um you have kids as well absolutely to to have to have that hard conversation about race and justice and the the notion of fairness in this country living as an african-american man it takes a lot out of you and so i I have to tell you i i i arrived here today on sunday after a very emotionally draining uh week if you if you will you know we just recently saw the incident uh in windsor virginia with the army lieutenant yeah um karan nazario he happens to be a fraternity brother uh of mine and it was you know the the next is there. I, you know, my older brother recently retired from the United States Army. My my wow. kids idolize their uncle, their uncle Bobby, who <laughs> made it to the the rank of sergeant major in the United States Army. They view him and, and, and the uniform that he wears as something that is that is almost that is almost sacred. And so to see an army lieutenant treated the way he did for for just um, you know. When the all the officers had to do was do a little extra due diligence to see that the temporary tag was there, was in the was it was was was, was there the entire time. Yet, right, right, and the the entire time, but yet and still, you know, this, you know, just engaged in, in a very just just ridiculous response to what could have been quickly de-escalated if if, if they had only asked a couple of routine questions. And so, you going back to your 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 question. Um, doctor, it, it is it is my hope that you know my kids are able to grow up in a society where they are viewed for their humanity and less so for the color of their of their skin. I, I I'm certain your previous guest, Delegate Bagby, who's done some tremendous things as chair of the, the Virginia Legislative 
uh, Black Caucus, particularly with respect to voting rights and, and criminal justice. And, you know, this past session, we saw the, the, um, the abolishment of, of the death penalty, something in which we can all be, be proud of and, and get our arms around. But I, I, would, I would take it a step further and say, although, yes, we have, we have abolished the death penalty, but what is it to be said that for African-American men, you know, their death row seems to be now giving to, to the routine traffic stop. Wow. And so I think that that speaks to the, the work that we can that we'll, we we have to continue to do and, and, and press forward on together as 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 a unified community all across the Commonwealth. Absolutely. You know, Rod, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that conversation and, you know, yeah, my, my son, my oldest son is headed off to college uh, next uh well, this fall, he was accepted into Howard University, and and you know we, we had to, we had that conversation when he started driving. Hey, yeah. you know this is how it happens, right? Uh, our, yeah. our, our youngest son is, you know, transitioning into uh, well, finishing first year of high school, and you know he's getting ready to start driving. So, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, I I, I heard the has the trepidation in your voice even as you started to talk about the conversation that you were having, you know, with your son because you have to take a collective deep breath and exhale right. and say, "Hey, these are the cards we're dealt right now, but we can change the game. We can That's change right. the game." And and the way we do that is being a part of the solution, being a part of the mechanism to change, and that's through public policy. So, tell that's us, correct. you know, what, what what inspired you? You know, like I said, we're both here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a phenomenal place uh, to really be at this particular time in history. And but you know, to say, hey, I'm a, I'm going to leave what I'm doing and cast my 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 ticket in and say, hey. I want to run and do bigger things as a public servant. What went through your mind and what was the mechanism or that actually caused you to do that? I, I appreciate that. Appreciate that question um, very much. And I, I'm, I'm sure my wife is still pondering that, <laughs> that, that question as well. Uh, prior to me breaking out to, uh, to canvas later on this afternoon, but you know, Eric, where, where we're from, obviously, you know, the, the importance, of service to our fellow man and, and, and woman is something that is that is drilled in us uh, at an early uh, age, and essentially that's what <clears throat> that's what my candidacy uh, is all about. Here, I'm a father, a husband, uh, a proud public servant who is running for uh, delegate to represent the 31st House District because it, it just very fundamentally, I, I believe this district deserves a representative who is ready to hit the ground running on day one and, and to to be a bridge, to go where the constituents are to help us get to the other side of, you know, the number of crises we, we, we currently face. And I, I believe that I am I am that, that person. Uh, my wife and I established roots here within eastern Prince William County, just south of uh, just south of Washington. Oh yeah. Well over 14, 14 years ago. She and I uh, met on Capitol Hill uh, she was working for her hometown congressman uh, from Arkansas. I was working for uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, who represents uh, Dallas, Texas, and former chair of the Congressional uh, Black Caucus. And uh-huh. we managed to uh, put our, our meager staff salaries together and, and purchase our first home uh, <laughs> here in the in the county, if you will. We we worship here, right down the road at First Mount Zion Baptist Church, where Delegate Luke Torian. Uh, Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee is uh, our pastor. Uh, I'm proud to call him uh, an endorser, as well as your your previous guest, Delegate Lamont uh, Bagby. Yeah. Both have uh, have endorsed me. Our kids go to go to public school here. Um, we love this community. We feel not only we feel fully vested in not only our community's challenges, but uh, its triumphs, but also its challenges as well. And to, and to your point. You know, the only way we we see change, in, in my view, is to, you know, not Monday morning quarterback back from the sideline, but to to get in the the, the, the game to affect change. And I've, I've as you you alluded to earlier, I, I fully view public policy as the ultimate equalizer, if you will, that has an opportunity when done equitably right. can uplift all segments of all segments uh, of, of our of our community. But we we in order for that to happen. We need more folks like like us with, from from the from the African American community to, to to get in the game and and be unapologetic about it. I tell right. folks all the time when I think about my uh, my grandmother, bless her heart, who grew up 
uh, on sharecrop lands in East Texas. She and my, my grandfather had their livelihoods threatened, be, threatened because they merely wanted to be participants in the democratic process, mm. which ultimately, ultimately led to my grandfather purchasing his own land, them doing, you know, th- uh, you know, them taking sort of their, 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 their destiny by their own hands, right. if you will. And I'm, I'm certain with an eye towards, you know, one day our kids, our grandchildren, our, you know, our great grandchildren, will not have to endure some of the indignities that we that we have to that we currently have to have to endure poll taxes etc and so i sort of view it as 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 a as a nod uh-huh. of um, of honor to all of our our forebearers and forerunners um, to you know if i feel that i'm competent i feel that i have something to offer if folks in the community have asked me to um, you know offer myself as a as a candidate for for elected office I view it as uh, as the very least we could do to honor our, our ancestors and our forerunners who put their lives on the line, who suffered the indignity, so that we would one day be able to participate in a democratic process as we as we as we see fit, and that's what I'm doing. You're listening to WNSB Blazing Hot and Anyone here on the campus of Norfolk State University. You're listening to State of Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville, and here in the month of April, May, and June, we're bringing candidates who want to run for statewide office to represent you in Richmond. Right now, we're talking to Mr. Rod Hall, who is a candidate for the 31st District here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Rod, you know, you you mentioned the things that your you know your your grandparents and you saw them go through, and and also you know your story, and I and I think about you know how you know my father you know wanted to start his own business, so we had a yeah. family daycare for twenty one years, you know, and yeah. and how you know there were individuals in the community that sometimes couldn't pay. Right. Yeah. But but still, we my father said, oh, it's OK. Just pay me next week. Or it got so much. So I say, just pay me whatever you can and we'll wipe the slate clean. Mm-hmm. And when mm-hmm. I when I listen to your story and I, I think yeah. about all the families that we grew up around and we think about it in Shreveport, man. I mean, there are some great people that came out of there, including yourself, Absolutely. you know, that yeah. are doing great things across the country and the world. You know, it's. Is that type of service, that type of heart that that I believe public servants should have? What are some of the community interests that that you have that you can not just start that you're doing now, but you'll continue even after this election? Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things I um, um, am delighted to to talk about. You mentioned, you know, your father and the, the family, the family business. My mother was a teacher's aide for over, you know, close to 40, 40 years, oh, at a, wow. school, a special needs school by the name of Caddo Exceptional uh, School. You may recall it was right adjacent to uh, LSU Hospital. Yep. Yep. Um, and, you know, at the age of four, as you, you alluded to, uh, my father was, was robbed uh, of us due to a massive, um, massive stroke. And so I can only imagine what must have been going through my mom's mind at the time. It's like, oh, Lord, I just lost my husband. I have this mm. four-year-old. How can I, I help, you know, keep him on the, the right trajectory, if you, if you will? And to your point, Eric, you know, we, were, we are the, you know, the, the, the beneficiaries of, you know, the, the, old, the age-old adage of it takes a village. Folks from the community wrap their arms around me, and I, and I, I could, you know, just take a step further and, and, and say it seems as if they were convinced and say we will not let you know we will not lose lose this kid to the to the streets if you will and so one of the things that I've been talking about uh, a lot on the trail is the need for universal pre-K here uh, in Virginia as I indicated my mom was a teacher's aide I have a very soft spot for for teachers teachers aide and and uh, and their support staff and I really want to continue. Uh, advocacy with respect to improving our education system by, by expanding universal pre-K. It is my firm belief that a comprehensive early childhood system that provides access to affordable, high-quality child care for all children yes. can have significant benefits for child development, ensuring that we're able to get kids to the door of kindergarten that are able to read uh, and write, but also, Dr. Clavill, as we as we you know, transition to the other side of this pandemic and hopefully, you know, get back to pre-pandemic employment levels, you know, it's going to place an even greater 
burden and emphasis on ensuring that our three-year-olds and our four-year-olds are able to to be transitioned to an environment that they are able to be nurtured, cared for, and and provide some type of high quality uh, learning that also allows the mom and or dad to have some semblance of economic security so that they're able to work and not have to worry about, you know, whether or not my child is in a nurturing environment, he or she is able, and and whether or not he or she is able uh, to learn. So that would be uh, a very uh, top priority focus matter uh, for me as well. I think we currently, um, the Commonwealth ranks maybe 31st with respect to access to uh, a quality pre-K program, I think we ranked 31st uh, mm-hmm. based on uh, the last numbers I saw from the National Institute for uh, Early uh, Education Research. And so that tells me we have more, more work to do, and I look forward to being uh, a staunch advocate for doing all we can to further expand uh, universal pre-K here within the Commonwealth. Absolutely. You know, there's there's so many and I don't know why we don't have it that policy across the country. There are so mm-hmm. many studies that that prove, you know, just that one extra year. Right. One. That's just it. say one extra year before what we call big boy and big girl school, because, you know, right. you know, we, we both are raising children and we understand right. those talks we have, you know, the, the just the, the impact that it has. Not just up on the learning ability and the capabilities of that child, but the benefits to the community right. and the right. country as a whole. You know, right. you talk about that common sense, uh, community interest, and really policy. What are some of the other policies that, that if, if elected uh, to the 31st district, uh, what are some of the other policies that you're looking to champion and push in your first uh, term? Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for that question. You know, obviously, we're just off of. Um, um, African American um, or, or Black Maternal Health Week, uh, if you will, and so obviously the the issue of maternal morbidity uh, and ensuring for the health of uh, pregnant women and their uh, the, the newborns uh, was obviously uh, and rightfully so an issue of uh, immense focus uh, on last week. You know, in, in conversations with some of the um, OBGYNs here that, you know, comprise sort of my healthcare brain trust, if uh-huh. you will. You know, I shared the story about uh, the experience my wife and I experienced uh, two years ago uh-huh. with the uh, anticipated arrival uh, of my daughter, Peyton. And there were complications that uh, arose during, um, during delivery that, long story short, resulted in my, my wife being uh, transported to the adult ICU wing mm. and my, my new princess being uh, trans, transported over to the, uh, the NICU wing. So for the next five days, which is usually a time for joy and, and excitement and anticipation for, for parents, I spent the next five days diligently pacing between the NICU, checking on my daughter and the, the dedicated health care team devoted to her and saving her life. And then transferring, walking over to the other side of the hospital, focusing on my wife wow. uh, and a dedicated team uh, working to to save her life. So it was a very harrowing situation there for my brother um, for for a while. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, the entire time I couldn't help but but remember recalling asking myself, what would have happened here if we if we lacked proper health health healthcare insurance? Mm. You know, and so that has led me to to think about. You know, where do we see current holes with respect to maternal health within Medicaid? Right now, uh, current law allows for a pregnant mother to have uh, coverage two months after the delivery of the child. I think that should be extended from two, from two months uh, to 12 months to ensure that we are, we are doing all that we can to ensure not only the health of the child, but the health of the mother. Because data clearly shows that there are disparities with respect to maternal health and African American and other minority uh, women, so that that would be uh, an area of focus. With respect to um, broadband access here within um, the Commonwealth, I was almost floored to learn that 13.3 percent of Virginia households do not have an internet subscription. Are you serious? If this pandemic, yes. If this pandemic wow. has taught us one thing, it has taught us about the importance of 
the the ability to have digital uh, access not only for for learning but also for you know one's profession and and and, and job skills uh, propensity uh, as well and so ensuring that we're able to ensure as as I as what I like to to phrase you know we need to ensure that there, there's no household left offline if you are to ensure that we do all we can to close the digital uh, divide. So I've been a big proponent of space-based enabled um, broadband access. Virginia is the leader in commercial space launches. You know, why not utilize, why not utilize some of those <laughs> capabilities with the satellites that we, that we are launching, you know, to be on the cutting, to be on the cutting edge of, of broadband uh, deployment here uh, within the Commonwealth. So each year, uh, the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative uh, receives a host of uh, funding requests from localities all all across the Commonwealth. A number of those are un, you know unmet needs due to the due to lack of funding. And so I think we've really got to double down in ensuring that we're able to do all we can to close the digital divide with the appropriate funding, streamline some of the some of the the bureaucracy that I consider rather top heavy at the moment to ensure that there's no kid who has to drive around with his parents looking for a particular hotspot at a library or a McDonald's or, or any other type of institution so that they can do so that they can do their work. And so those are just a just a just a couple. And obviously mass transit for our area is uh, is a very big deal as I know it yeah. is down, down your way. Uh, working to ensure that I'm able to leverage my transportation policy and the experience that I learned on Capitol Hill, also within the Obama administration, to press uh, for ultimately uh, an extension of the Metro Blue Line down into down into our area to ensure our residents have Absolutely. quality, affordable transportation options so they can get to their jobs, so that kids can get to school, social services, community services, uh, what have you. And so, again, brother, just based on yeah. my collective set of experiences, I, I think I am the, the I know that I'm the right man for for the job that can hit the ground running on day one. Absolutely. You know, listen, as uh, I know you personally and, and I know you have the heart to do it. I know you've got, you know, everything you've worked you, that you have, you work for, you've achieved. Uh, and of course, I forgot to mention that you are a former Obama appointee and uh, that is correct. currently that is serve correct. and you currently serve on the transportation uh, board or committee here in Virginia. Is that correct? That's correct. I am, uh, you know, tra- I've, I've been a been an avid lover of trains and, and, and planes uh, for uh, a long time. Uh, I was able to uh, serve on Capitol Hill for ten years, working in, in transportation policy. Uh, was the honor of my life to join uh, the administration of President Barack Obama as head of uh, congressional affairs for the Federal Aviation Administration, one of the largest. Um, federal agencies uh, in the federal government uh, carrying the administration's aviation priorities before the House and the, and the Senate, working to make uh, civil aviation uh, more uh, safe here within the country. Uh, I'm now a, a partner with uh, Ken O'Gates Law Firm in the public policy practice in, in downtown D.C., where aviation uh, is a key focus of mine. But here locally, Yes, was uh, honored to have been appointed by uh, Governor Collis at the time to the Commonwealth Aviation Board, uh, subsequently following uh, elevated to chair, and we're able to provide state funding to all of the Commonwealth 66 public use airports across across the state. Uh, was honored to have been appointed to the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority by Governor Ralph Northam uh, last year as we work to uh, advance passenger rail. Um, here within the Commonwealth, and I also sit on a on a local airport authority. I serve as the Prince William County uh, representative to the Staff- Stafford uh, Regional Airport Authority uh, here locally. So I, I've long been a pro. I say all that to say I've long been a proponent of the ability of infrastructure, transportation, and infrastructure development as a way to to unleash absolutely uh, ec- economic development and provide good paying jobs. Everyone, that's Rod Hall for Delegate for House 31. You can find more information about him on his website. Go to Rod Hall VA, Rod Hall for Virginia Delegate 31. Rod, I can say that everyone from Shreveport, everybody from the class of 93, 94 and on are so proud of you. Thank you so much for joining us here on State of Water, and we wish you all the best. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Bill, and that's R-O-D-H-A-L-L-F-O-R-V-A.com. That's Rod Hall for VA. You got it.
Thanks right. so much for having me. We'll see you next week.